Um, first, um, I'm going to defer on my side, and the um, gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, again, I want to applaud the fact that we're holding this hearing in this committee. Back in 2009 and 10, when the Affordable Care Act was crafted with three different committees, it was our committee which led the way in terms of pre-existing conditions and all the patient protections, because we have jurisdiction over ERISA. Uh, so, uh, again, we, we actually were the, um, the place where the law was written um, that was, in my opinion, you know, one of the great step forward uh, of our nation in terms of uh, social and civil rights. Um, you know, again, Ms. Corlett talked about what uh, the landscape looked like back in 2009 and 10. I brought along a flyer that, uh, for, uh, that was being sold to a, a lot of businesses, which, uh, again, brings back uh, the bad old days. Again, it, it's a, a health plan where it's touted as great news for people who buy their own health insurance, a, a flexible health plan, affordable. However, if you flip to the back, it had sort of in the, in the smaller print uh, the fact that uh, it, they may not be able to cover people who've ever had treatment for the following, AIDS, alcohol or drug dependence, cancer, COPD, connective tissue disorder, Crohn's disease, diabetes, emphysema, heart attack or stroke, hepatitis, inpatient, emotional or mental illness, organ or tissue uh, transplant, uh, or colitis. So if you're like an episode of Survivor and you're not in that uh, category, however, it, you're, you're still not out of the, the woods yet because it also says that uh, other individuals who are obese, underweight, um, are, have undergone diagnostic uh, tests for a whole variety of, of different illnesses, uh, as well as uh, expectant parents or children less than two months old are also not going to be uh, able to take advantage of that policy. And lastly, it says this list is not at all is not all inclusive. Other conditions may apply. So I mean that's what health insurance looked like until uh, President Obama signed uh, the Affordable Care Act in March of 2010, which once and for all abolished this whole type of medical underwriting uh, practice. And again, it was also uh, architecture that was built around it to make that uh, meaningful, such as essential health benefits, the lifetime caps, which uh, Mr. Reedy so powerfully uh, testified to, uh, adjusted community ratings so that older people can't be charged more than uh, three times uh, a younger individual. So um, again, regarding the Texas case, uh, as Dr. Gupta said, I mean, there's absolutely no question um, that the Justice Department, which participated with the plaintiffs and not, did not defend the Department of Health and Human Services, if that ruling were to stand, uh, again, that would just take a wrecking ball to the whole um, architecture, again, that was built. Is that correct, uh, uh, Ms. Corlett? Uh, that's correct. Uh, for the plaintiff states, if their position prevails, the entire law would be invalidated. And in terms of uh, some of the other um, changes that they've made through the regulatory process, the uh, association health plans, which again, on surface sounds great, um, that uh, small businesses can team together in different sectors and go out and buy collectively. By the way, that was totally legal prior to the Trump administration's uh, ruling, and there were about 600 association health plans across the country. What the ruling really did was it basically allowed those plans to avoid, uh, again, a lot of these patient protections uh, such as essential health benefits, which were painstakingly designed with the Institute of Medicine in terms of what, what, is, what is health care and what, what should health insurance be, uh, and lifetime caps, et cetera. So again, I just wonder if you could sort of focus on that point, that the administration, uh, again, is in fact undermining pre-existing conditions and pre-existing condition um, protections with those types of regulatory actions. That's absolutely correct. Um, uh, groups of employers have always been able to join an association and offer benefits if they choose to do so. Um, what the administration is encouraging is arrangements that essentially are allowed to cherry pick um, the healthiest and youngest employer groups out of the regulated market um, and thereby gain a pricing advantage. And the short-term plans, Dr. Gupta, you mentioned, again, it's the same story, is that um, it's really a device uh, to avoid, uh, again, the protections that were built into the Affordable Care Act. 
That's very true, and along with that, the other part of this is the medical loss ratio that was built into the ACA, and uh, that is not subject to in the short-term plan. So they can have as much as 50% medical loss ratio and actually profit uh, disproportionately. And the, the short-term plans are really not that short. Uh, again, when the uh, prior administration allowed for a very short, short-term plan, these now almost take, uh, are basically going to be sold for an entire year. Isn't that correct? Correct. They could be sold for about 364 days and then renewable afterwards. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a whole new product. And again, we would see the bad old days in terms of, uh, you know, this type of laundry lists of fine print where people are going to have a rude awakening when they thought they had insurance. And in fact, it, it, it was totally useless and meaningless. I yield back.